Hello everybody, welcome back to Weekly Wildlife Wisdom. So far I've been your host, Zero Yeti, and this week we're doing an extinct uh, special, which, for those of you who don't know, it's typically the inverse of our normal content. With our normal content being, we cover six extant and one extinct, and in the extinct special case, we do six extinct and one extant. Without further ado, let's go into it. The first animal of the week being Dictodon, which is a genus of Placicephalodicynodont, which is a lineage of mammal-like synapsids that lived during the late Permian period, approximately 255 million years ago. Also have been found in the Madubabusia mudstone in the Laguang Basin in Zambia, the Tiklo Formation, Abraham Skral Formation, Bolfor Formation, and Middleton Formation of South Africa, and the Goyo de King. Uh, formation of China. Measuring around 12 to 15 inches in length and weighing between 1 and 3 pounds, Dictodon sport a short round body, stubby legs, sharp claws on the front feet, a small yet strong beak, and like other Dicynodons, it possessed a pair of large tusks that erupted and pointed down from the upper jaw. In life, Dictodon would have lived in arid scrubland around water sources such as rivers, oases, and floodplains. And they would have most likely been a primarily nocturnal animal, spending the night socializing and feeding upon roots, leaves, and seeds of various desert shrubs and bushes, while escaping the harsh heat of the air in days by burrowing. Dictodon burrows typically spiral down up to six feet into the ground before leveling off to a terminal chamber where pairs of Dictodon would have slept, uh, groomed each other, and reared young. Although Dictodon did not build interconnecting burrows with others of its species, evidence suggests that large numbers would have gathered and burrowed in close proximity to one another in a fashion similar to modern-day gophers. This unique adaptations, as well as lifestyle, allowed Dictodont to be one of the most successful synapses throughout the late Permian period. Next up is Herrerasaurus, which is a genus of dinosaurs that lived during the late Triassic period around 231 million years ago in the Ischialosto formation of what is now northwestern Argentina. Herrerasaurus was named and described by paleontologist Osvaldo Ring in 1963, who named the animal after Victoria Herrera, an Andean goat hoarder and geologist who first uncovered the fossils in 1959. In fact, the name Herrerasaurus literally means Herrera's lizard. The phylogenetic placement, as well as the wider implications of Herrerasaurus, has been the subject of a lot of debate amongst paleontologists. With its bipedal stance and skull features, Herrerasaurus was considered by some to be a basal theropod, while other paleontologists long thought that Herrerasaurus represented a basal sauropodomorph, and still others argue that Herrerasaurus wasn't a dinosaur at all, but a closely related yet distinct archosaur. Clear identification was not helped by the fact that Herrerasaurus has a number of features that can be found across all groups of dinosaurs. However, the discovery of an almost complete skeleton in 1988, in addition to remains that additional remains have, that have since been found has led Herrerasaurus to be classified as an early Sorosuchian dinosaur inside the family Herrerasauridae, and one of the earliest true dinosaurs to have evolved. Measuring up to 20 feet in length and 770 pounds in weight, Herrerasaurus was a lightly built bipedal carnivore with a large tail, robust arms, long legs, and a relatively small head. The skull was rather boxy, featuring a sliding lower jaw that's unique amongst dinosaurs. This skull uh, sliding action may have allowed Herrerasaurus to rake its teeth through prey, as well as to better swallow food. Herrerasaurus was also unique in that it had digitigrade stance, which meant that it walked on its toes so that its foot actually served to extend the length of the leg, increasing its overall stride and top speed. In life, Herrerasaurus would have inhabited the temperate forests along the volcanic mountain ranges of Jurassic South America. Using its fairly substantial size, speed, and agility to catch and feed upon sphenodonts, synapsids, rhynchosaurs, amphibians, and other early dinosaurs such as Eoraptor, while avoiding larger predators such as Sarosuchus. Next up is Eremorthurium, which is also known as the Pan American Ground Sloth and is an extinct genus of group living ground sloth in the family Megatheriidae. It was endemic to the Americas during the Pleistocene Epoch from around 4.9 million years ago to around 11,000 years ago. The earliest remains that can be attributed to Eremothurium were assembled and described by one Peter Wilhelm Lund, who dubbed the animal but with its common name being the Pan American Ground Sloth in 1852. However, it wouldn't be for another 106 years that the genus would be given its scientific name Eremothurium in 1948 by Austrian paleontologist Franz Spillman. Today, currently three species are recognized, being E. Loreliadari, 
E. Ir Eo Migrans and E. Rusconi. Measuring some 20 feet in length and upwards of 3 tons in weight, Eremortherium was amongst the largest known ground sloths, rivaling Megatherium Americanum in size. Compared to Megatherium, Eremortherium can be differ differentiated by its more robust physique, smaller head, longer limbs, and hands tipped with three massive claws. These claws would have been used to strip leaves and bark off of trees, as well as break branches, uh, knock over trees, and ward off predators. The skull had a relatively delicate structure with the dentition consisting of uniformly shaped high crown teeth. Fossils of Eremortherium have been found throughout the United States, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil. In life, Eremortherium would have been a somewhat gregarious species that inhabited a range of habitats from grasslands to open woodland to marshes. Uh, they would have traveled in loose snuggles, and snuggles, fun fact, is the name for a group of sloths, of upwards of 20 individuals feeding upon grasses, forbs, shrubs, trees, and other leafy vegetation. The dodo, which is next up, is the species of moderately sized flightless birds that was endemic to the islands of Mauritius, uh, which is east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. The dodo's closest genetic relative was the Rodriguez solitaire, and the two formed the, family, the subfamily Raphidae. Raphidae, uh, which is now an extinct clan in the family Columbidae, which includes modern pigeons and doves, with the Nicobar pigeon being the dodo's closest living relative. Measuring around 3 feet 3 inches in height and 20 to 40 pounds in weight, these birds sport a brownish gray plumage, yellow feet, a tuft of tail feathers, a gray naked head, and a black, yellow, and green beak. Contrary to, to its historical portrayal as being fat and clumsy, the dodo was actually quite agile, well adapted to its island ecosystem, where it inhabited dry coastal woodland. In life, dodos would have roamed in small flocks, feeding upon a variety of fruits, seeds, roots, and bulbs, even, even utilizing their strong beak to break open nuts and shellfish. Feeding was further aided by gizzard stones, which would have allowed the birds to better grind up and adjust their food. Breeding occurred around August, during which time a dodo pair would have constructed a ground nest out of palms, grasses, and other vegetation. Here a single white egg would have been laid, tended to by both parents. Young dodos grew up quickly, reaching maturity at well in one year of age. The first recorded mention of the dodo was by Dutch sailors in 1598, and in the following years the bird was hunted extensively by sailors for its meat, while its eggs and young were preyed upon heavily by invasive species such as dogs, pigs, rats, cats, and crab-eating macaques. All while its habitat was being cleared for agriculture and lumber. Less than 100 years after its discovery, the governor of Mauritius, Isaac Johannes Lamotanus, reported hunting down the last three known dodo birds in, in 1688. Next up is Paraposocia, which is an extinct genus of Desmoceratid ammonites that lived throughout what is now Africa, Europe, and North America during the Cenomanian and Camptian ages of the, of the Cretaceous period, from around 100 million years ago to 72 million years ago. First uncovered and described by Herman Landos in 1815, it was first considered to be a member of the Pachydiscus genus, but was renamed to its a distinct genus in 1913. Today, the Paraposeus genus is regarded as the largest omnites to have ever existed, with all six species sporting shells of at least two feet in diameter. And the largest species, the European Paraposeus sepin Rodensis, uh, sporting a shell of upwards eight and a half feet wide and 15,555 pounds in weight, making it amongst the largest cephalopods known to live, have ever lived. As far as locomation goes, Paraposia would have had a siphon pointed out, the, out of its shell that could shoot water like a jet, allowing for a greater range in vertical movement up the water column at the cost of reduced distance traveled in comparison to modern cuttlefish and squid. Almanites like Paraposocia uh, were perceived to have been pelagic predators of other ocean organisms such as fish, other cephalopods, and even small marine reptiles, which after catching with its tentacles, Paraposocia would have fatally dispatched with a bite from its strong, tough beak that could easily slice flesh, crush shells, and break bones. 
Despite their large size and former appearance, Paraposia themselves were preyed upon by sharks that had exceptionally tough teeth, like Crotoxyrhina and the giant strong beaked marine turtle Archleon, as well as Mosasaurus, such as Talosaurus and Mosasaurus itself, whose large size alone may have allowed it to easily dispatch these marine cephalopods. Next up is Cavaramus, which is a genus of Cavarama pterosaur that lived during the late Triassic period from around 210 million years ago to 205 million years ago throughout the lower Cozen formation of what is now the northern Calcareous Alps of Switzerland. The first fossil specimen consisting of teeth, the lower jaw, and the parts of the neck was described by Nadia Frobrisk and George Frobrisk, who named the animal Cavaramus Cheshaplanensis, with the genus name of being derived from the Latin cavus, meaning hollow, and ramus, meaning branch, and the species name refers to the specific mountain it was discovered on, that being Mount Chesaplan. Thus, a second specimen, consisting of a disarticulated partial skeleton and a mostly complete skull, showed that Cavaramus sported four-fingered hands, short back legs that were connected with a small membrane, and long, a long thin tail and a 53-inch wingspan. The skull, in particular, shows they had a tall, thin, bony crest running along the midline in the front of the upper jaw and a keel on the lower jaw. The teeth in the front of the upper jaw in the premaxillae were fang-like, whereas the teeth in the upper cheeks, which are the maxillae, had three, four, or five cusps, similar to that of Eudimorphodon. While it's most certainly used its gracile wings for some soaring flight, based on the proportions of the limbs and the structure of the teeth, Cabaramus is thought to have been a primarily herbivorous terrestrial forager, feeding upon seeds, fruit, ferns, and other plant material, as well as occasionally insects, crustaceans, small vertebrates, and sources of carrion. And our extant animal week is the coyote, also known as the American jackal. It is a species of canine native throughout North and Central America, from Alaska in the north to Panama in the south. Here they primarily inhabit grasslands and desert regions, but can be found throughout mountainous regions, broken forests, pasture land, even urban areas. Coyotes are often opportunistic and highly adaptable animals that are known to feed on carrion, insects, eggs, crustaceans, trash, and a variety of plant materials such as fruits, berries, roots, cactus, nuts, beans, and grasses. However, the bulk of their diet could typically consist of other vertebrates such as ground and water birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, small to medium-sized mammals, chiefly rodents and rabbits. In many areas, coyotes will often form symbiotic relationships with American badgers who, by working together, can dramatically increase both how often and how much prey they catch. Additionally, if hunting in large enough packs, coyotes have been known to successfully bring down large prey such as turkey, deer, swans, bighorn sheep, harp seals, peccary, bobcats, cougars, and even young and infirm elk, moose, bison, and bears. Coyotes are themselves frequently preyed upon by wolves, cougars, and jaguars, and less frequently by lynx, alligators, bears, and golden eagles. Although the size varies geographically, coyotes typically measure between 3 to 4.5 feet in length and 20 to 45 pounds in weight, with males being slightly larger than females. The coloration of the coat also varies from region to region, and is typically a mixture of light gray and orange interspersed with patches of black and white. While albinism is exceedingly rare in coyotes, melanistic individuals are becoming increasingly common due to interbreeding with domestic dogs. Coyotes can be differentiated from both wolves and dogs by their smaller size, lighter frame, longer tails, thinner face, longer ears, and larger brain case. Although some are solitary, coyotes are typically highly social animals which live in loose packs of up to 20 individual coyotes and occasionally a befriended badger. These packs are often formed by a central breeding pair and their offspring and other relatives. However, albeit rarely, packs of completely unrelated coyotes are known to form. Mating occurs during winter and after a 63-day gestation period, mothers give birth in early spring to around six pups. Coyotes reach sexual maturity around one year of age and live upwards of 15 years under ideal conditions. As always, take care of my guys, girls, and my binary pals.